stand clear. 100% Wild Podcast. So for all you listeners, hello and welcome to definitely not your favorite outdoor podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Drury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. We're powered by DeerCast, and this is episode number 285. And you continue to be Matt Drury. And you continue to be Tim Chelsvick, and we have a special guest in the studio <laughs> yeah, we today. we got Jared Lurk, fresh off his... Real uh, Deer Madness. Yeah, Canadian uh-huh. trip. Alberta it's adventure. to Alberta. So this is a trip... That you guys, I mean, between Mark and you and Wade, and I mean, we've had, you know, Brandon for a couple of years, we've been going on it. I think the first time, I, the first I time I think I filmed Mark was maybe 2004. Mm-hmm. So we've been going down the Corey, Corey, the pancake Corey Jarvis, Three Rivers Adventures. So Mark went first time 2003 and they went whitetail hunting, Scott Schultz. What's old is new again. Scent blocker. Yeah. Took him and they, mm-hmm. they, they're, they're driving past all these mule deer whitetail hunting and Mark is like. Why are we hunting these? <laughs> Could I go get one of those? Right. So in 2004, he started. 05, I guess he took. 04, he took you. 05, he took Booty. And then 06, I went. And then yeah. I went from 06 to 2016. I missed two years because of kids, and I hadn't been since 2016. Yeah. And actually, I was there the year Booty was there, if I remember right. And Andrea from Scent Blocker oh, and probably. Scott Schultz. And we were hunting. What you're, you're right. We were hunting both. Oh, oh yeah, we hunted for a while. White tails and, and mule deer. What's the white tail so hunting like? Because it's so open up there. It's very different. Drainages, you, river, yeah. river crossings. Yeah, okay. we, we hunted. The, literally, the t- white tail was coming across the river, and it was uh, interesting. And didn't you kill a mm-hmm. white tail yeah. crossing the river? Yes. Uh, so Tyler would have been 16. I think he's 31 now. If I'm doing the math right, maybe he's 29. Corey's son. Corey's son, Tyler, and uh, killed a 158 inch 10 point, Ooh. like a really, really big deer at 20 yards, and. Tyler, we were mule deer hunting, and Tyler scouted that deer every morning mm-hmm. and every evening and told us where to go, where to set the blind. We set the blind up that morning and then killed it. And the, it, it, the thing about whitetails up there, they are way harder to kill than Missouri whitetails. They are imagine, way yeah. harder. Like, their senses are ten times better than Missouri whitetails. I'd be screwed. <laughs> I'd be no chance. Oh, give me another reason not to kill one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, then you throw in just, like, the blood tracking. If they're crossing rivers, like, that that adds just a whole other yes. level to it. Well, I mean, we were shooting Rage at that time. He was 20. What I always say is you take this. It's big sky country. You take this giant province mm-hmm. and whittle it down to stick and string range, which is really, really difficult to do. We did it Ugh. 22 yards, and then, he, like, all the other deer that crossed with him, he was the only one that didn't go back across the river. And what was cool is they started at 100, uh-huh. and the way the river pushed them, it was almost up to their back. They ended up at 22. Wow. Yeah, like they were crossing straight Dude. across the river, but it, it pushed so hard, and they go up to what would be the equivalent of our soybean fields, their pea fields, mm-hmm. and they, they just they absolutely love them. Mm. Peas up there. I thought it was canola. No, it's peas. The, the muleys eat canola. The okay. whitetails eat peas. Gotcha. Yeah, and Everything's it's, weird in Canada. And so it's, it's just a little different. A little beautiful different. country. The like continental it. divide right through the middle. It's just like you don't realize how big it is until you try to start climbing up some of those. <laughs> For the flatlanders, it's, it's like a little tough. Crap. Well, it, the, so this year was a little different. I flew into Bozeman. Normally, I flew into Calgary. I flew into Bozeman. It, it, Wade joked because I get older, I took the scenic route, which I did on purpose. And we flew, we drove from Bozeman because he's only an hour across the border. Mm-hmm. And it that drive through Montana was absolutely beautiful. But what I noticed right away is I put myself in put myself in reasonably good shape as Bozeman's at 5,000 feet. Sure. I got off the plane. I was like, I can't breathe already. All I'm doing is getting luggage. Yeah. Like this is going to be a tough trip. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember altitude being an issue when I went, not like it was like when I went to Utah, you know, at, at right. Austin's place. But I, I do remember just feeling a little different. Yes. Yeah. It, it, and but it, I was 20. Yeah. When you're 40, <laughs> things, yeah. you're not as healthy as you were. When Unless you're, you're Tim. Yeah. In great so, shape. Somehow this is going to turn Hold back on. to me. You want to punch me right now, but you won't. <laughs> I'll wait till afterwards. No, I, this is what I want to do with you. Oh, oh man. What did I do? Okay. Yeah, yeah you're working hard. <laughs> you got healthy. He deserves to get hit. Such a dick. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm curious, like the lead up to this, we're talking about prep. It's so darn, like every bit of footage I see up there, it's all windy. 
So how like are you doing anything in your in your archery practice to prepare for that? I've seen this. I got some insight here. He takes a fan, <laughs> one of those big commercial <laughs> ones that you have for your garage, and he points it on himself. It's brilliant. And then he just wobbling. What are you there. doing out in the backyard? <laughs> I'm practicing for Alberta, baby. <laughs> So a little bit yes and a lot no. Um, so That's the, Matt's life. Yeah. The, the <laughs> Tell big, me about it. The big prep that we learned a long time ago, I think the first trip I ever went on with Mark was actually maybe O2 in North Dakota. And, and those guys were shooting at 100 yards. And I thought, Whoa. what the? Well, I do that now. And I, it was a foreign concept to me 20 years ago. But now with the HHA and the Matthews and mm-hmm. the arrows we shoot, like in my yard, if I – can hit like this at a hundred when you get to 50, like it's a no brainer. Yeah. Like 50 is what 20 used to be to whitetails. If you sure. can shoot at a hundred. So all, all summer I started the week after 4th of July mm-hmm. and worked my way back to a hundred yards and shot all summer at a hundred in my wow. backyard. And so on our first day when I know I'm jumping ahead here, but when we got to the muley, I told Corey, just get me to 50. Like he's dead if we get to 50 and like that, that is a significant amount of confidence to know that if you can get to 50 in a 25 mm-hmm. mile an hour wind, that that mule deer is dead. Well, yeah. out there, you, I mean, if you really pay attention to all the hunts that we've had out there, I mean, 50 is pretty much 40 to 40 to 60 is the yeah. magic circle. When it's, when it's really, really windy, you might be able to get to 40. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if you get in, but the deal is if you get to 40 and they stand up and see you, cause there's three of you, Corey, a cameraman and you, a lot of times what they are bolt. those guys doing there. Yeah. But at 50, they don't, they'll stare at you. If it's windy, if it's not windy, you can only get to 60. And that's a whole different kettle of fish. Yeah, I I think it was 2020, maybe. Mark asked if I wanted to go up there, and I'm like, man, I'm not a good enough shot to go up there. A lot of <laughs> like, pressure. You can make yourself a good enough shot, yeah, though. Yeah, well, you're talking about like practicing at 50 and 100. Like The furthest I'm practicing is 30 in my backyard. It, it's, it all depends on where you live and what you have access to. Right. And, and I'm not going to – I know that – I don't have an area right. very easily to go shoot in the backyard, you know, like that kind of range. Mm-hmm. So I, I, it's just a hunt that I wouldn't. Now, listen, if, if, if we were to go say, hey, you're going on an elk hunt, that you got to figure it out, <laughs> I'd figure it out. You'd figure it out. But I passed on that hunt. I was like, man, I'm not in good enough. I'm not it, a good enough shot to do it. There's a, there's a significant amount more preparation for a mule deer hunt than I – white tails you prepare with the flute plots, the cameras, and the blinds. Mm, yeah. Mule deer, it's a – going back to Matt's question – or your question, I guess, you can't mimic 25 an hour, 25 mile an hour winds. But what you can do is make yourself a really good shot at 80 and 100. Mm-hmm. So then what Mark and I learned over time is just practice that day in the conditions. Yeah. Take the morel with you before you go on the stock and know if you've got a three inch arrow drift because mm. you sure. will. And then just account for that. So get yourself ready to to be good enough to kill a muley at 50 and 60. And what I mean by that, if you can kill a muley at 50 and 60, you got to be able to consistently hit the target at 80 and 100, sure. like almost double the distance. Now, will they drop like a whitetail at the shot? Like in, not in this not as much. Mm-mm. So they, they'll they stand there it. and, mm-hmm. okay. Yep. They well, don't react like a whitetail. It's nice. It kind of cuts that variable out. I can't imagine yes. trying to play that into yeah, you don't the wind have to. in the distance. Okay. Don't have to account for the drop like a whitetail. They'll drop a little, but not. they won't turn in. Like a whitetail, if you're shooting that sucker at 60, he ain't going to be there yeah. by the time the yeah. arrow gets there. But a muley will. And, yeah. and they're a good bit bigger, 30% bigger. Mm. You know, so they're back to the bottom of their chest is, I think it's almost a foot bigger than a whitetail. Like Jeez. there's more target there. Yeah. More blood volume too, I would yeah, assume. It goes yes. along with that. And... It's a, it, they, the other thing about them is they appear docile and not predator worry, but when mm-hmm. you get in that magic circle under 60, they're, they are, mm-hmm, they are, they understand mm-hmm. how to survive. Is they just let you get closer than whitetails. Sure. Is your arrow set up any different for muleys versus whitetails? Nope. Okay. It's, a, it's the exact same. Gotcha. Everything's the same. And what's funny is the comment Wade said that really impressed upon me because we're, sh- we're shooting at Corey's at 70 and 80 yards and Wade is a, mm-hmm. Wade's, he's a really good shot. Yeah. I have to work, like I got to work at it to be a really good shot. He, Clearly didn't practice like I did this summer, but he still shot as good as I did. Yeah, I hate at those people. Yeah, and then <laughs> right, and then when we're done, he goes, "Won't it be nice to see a white tail at twenty this summer?" It's like, yes, yeah, or this chip fall, shot. yes, yes, a twenty. Yeah, exactly, it's a two two foot putt. Jeez. When you practice all summer at eighty and hundred, yeah, sure. Uh. So, as you prepare, you get ready. You know, packing wise, like clothing wise, anything different that you know because you guys are spotting and stalking. What kind of preparation are you going through there? Walking shoes because rubber boots. Mm-hmm. For muleys, don't really cut it like you're going to burn your feet up too so bad. Like so hikers. Hike, hiking boots and 
really, really thick wool socks. Because what we did this time that's different than the times I've gone in the past is when you get under 120 yards, the shoes come off and the wool socks come on. Oh. And, and you just, at first when Mark and I learned that trick 15 years ago, I think we kind of laughed at it and, and mm -hmm. it works. Like you just significantly quiet down. The other preparation difference when you're within 150 and in closing on them is Corey doesn't belly crawl. He does it on his back and he scoots on his butt. And the oh. simple reason is your eyes are in the wrong spot when you're belly crawling. Like you have to look up. But if you're flipped over, you're, you're looking down at them. And you're actually quieter that way. Did you guys film any of that? Yeah, we filmed it all. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> we filmed it all. Because the, it. so like the preparation is I took less clothes. So I used deer cast. It's going to be hot. Like it was hotter there than it was at home. Yeah. My wife wanted to take the kids to the water park. I could have gone to the water park in Lethbridge, Canada, because it was 90 on Memorial Day or Labor Day, and it was like 76 here. Yeah, something it was like that. cool. The weather was different. So look at the weather. It was going to be warm. I didn't have to take any uh, base layers or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Just took two change of clothes and very limited amount of gear because he has a washer and dryer there. So I washed midweek yeah. and, and redid everything. So as you guys are kind of honing in, getting closer and closer, like spot and stalk out there, it's almost like, all right, you spot the herd or you figure out, which mm -hmm. they, you know, that's what Corey does. They kind of have a general idea. But then it seems like it's a series of calculated moves within a yes. few days to finally get close enough to have the opportunity at something you've been looking at through the Leupold's all week. Y yes, Leupold's and then... Tacticam's got this really cool little screen that attaches on the that Wade had. LR, I think. And it was just bad to the bone because mm -hmm. Wade and I could both use the spotter then. Yeah. Like, he just put that on there. He, he got the mule deer in the spotter, and then we could see it on this little screen yeah, and then yeah. it broadcast to his phone. It was a really cool yeah. little yeah, that's trick. Cool. Um, so, yeah, you have to wait for the right conditions and him to bed in the right spot. And then what Mark and I and Wade talked about going up is a refresher course. What were the four things we learned from Corey that I needed to redo because like I hadn't been there since 2016. That is a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece to that puzzle is I met Corey in 2006. I met my wife in 2007. We've had four children, the oldest of which just turned 13. So like I've known Corey longer than all of that. Yeah. So you go down memory lane, talk about all the great hunts you've had and all the successes were preceded by a lot of failures. And we didn't necessarily fail. We learned. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the big thing were shooting at long distances. That is that, yeah. that cannot go uh, mentioned enough. Like you have to be good at at minimum 80 yards. And then the slow and steady wins the race. I think when we first started going, there were there were more mule deer than there are now because quite honestly, Corey is really good at his craft, like yeah. the best in the Milky Way galaxy. So pay attention to one or two mule deer and hunt them all week, which is what we did on Wade's deer. I was lucky enough to capitalize on the first day. Part of me knowing this is there was a 25 mile an hour wind in the next mm -hmm. three days they were calling for no wind mule deer are 10,000 times harder to kill when there's no wind. Elk, mule deer. their ears are <laughs> this big mm -hmm. their eyes are this big like they're gonna hear you coming particularly yeah. three of you sure they're hearing you coming so uh, are they are they still grouped up like bat like whitetails mm -hmm. will be in bachelor groups over the Absolutely. summer time so how do you manage because you're, you're spotting stuff like you're focused on one animal but the reality is there's more to, eyeballs out there on mine there were eight mule deer we had to outsmart so 16 sets of eyeballs and mm. sometimes old uncle marvin quote from way way back in the day sometimes you can't do anything right and other times you can't do anything wrong we're we're getting into our mule deer and we were a little my first day a little bit out of position and for whatever reason the shooter gets up and walks closer to us like that never happens. It, it hadn't happened the whole I'll time. I'll take I've, that arrow. Right, exactly. And he got, he separated himself from the group, which made it much, much easier. Mm -hmm. That never happens. Wade's case was the exact opposite of that. The shooter was generally surrounded by three or four mm. mule deer that we had to outsmart. Yeah. We bumped them a couple of times mm. just because they're really good at staying alive. Yeah. Right. The old Dan Thurston quote, we're part-time deer hunters hunting full-time deer. <laughs> Dan is a part-time deer hunter. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm really part-time. Like most of my deer hunting recently has just been filming Henry. Yeah. So it, it took a little bit of me to um, dust the rust off, if you will, and get back in the game. Yeah. But it's, it's just so much fun. So much fun. So this episode, okay, the episode of this podcast airs, so we're filming it on what, what's today's date? The 13th. And so it'll air tomorrow, right? So this episode of... Your hunt mm -hmm. should be up by soon Sunday, I think. Yeah, I think Josh Sparks is working on it. It's yeah, Ben. Do you know when Jared's episode goes up? Um, I'm pretty sure Tuesday. 
Tuesday. Okay. So, yeah. So, as you're listening to this, the check out DeerCast and or YouTube, either one, and this sh- hunt should be up within the next few days. Well, so. yeah, and regardless, like you can still see the journal video, True. the kill mm-hmm. video in DeerCast. DeerCast. So if you want to see kind of the raw version of it, it's there. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, how did? If at all, how did DeerCast maps play into the trip? And Phenomenal. First time we've ever really had it, our crew out there using it like this. So let me, before I answer that, let me say this. The, the weather and the wind predictor of DeerCast, we used every day. And, and we knew we were going to struggle midweek because uncharacteristically, 90 degree highs followed with like two mile an hour winds. What happens in two mile an hour winds? Nothing. It blows 360 degrees yeah, yeah. and these, they have big noses, big eyes, big ears. So we couldn't get close to them. Like for three days we were out of the game because of the lack of wind, which never happens up there. Then which, go ahead. You could, the cool part is you can go out five days on that mm-hmm. wind checker. And, and so I, you could check your whole trip basically. Correct. And I told Wade and Corey, like, uh, the second to last day, we're going to have to make it happen. Then we didn't mm-hmm. find a mule deer at all. Yeah. We stocked none. 5.30 in the morning till 9.30 at night, we went on 0.0 stocks on the day that really Wade had to kill. We could not find the mature muley. What happened to him? Well, same thing that happens to whitetails. I don't know if you ever see it on your camera. They lose velvet at the first, like yeah. literally the same time whitetails down here do, mm-hmm. September 4th through the 6th. What happens to a whitetail when he loses velvet? He, like you don't see him. Yeah. He's gone for two to three days. So they literally disappeared. And on the last day, the second to last night, we found another big shooter. Bumped him because of we pushed the wind a little bit because we were running out of time. And what we learned the very last day is we got all day, take our time, don't bump him. And we did. I think we started hunting that deer at 8 in the morning, and he finally shot at 3 that afternoon. Quick side note to the the velvet comment. I still have deer in velvet. My biggest deer on the farm, just got a picture of him last night, still in velvet. Hmm. And Mark and Dad have both noticed the same thing. Their deer are in velvet a lot later this year. I asked Mark what his thoughts were. And, of course, he's going through, you know, the drought up there. And he goes, I think it's water-related. Water-related. You know, they might be a little more sick or whatever, and they're just not there, not going through their normal Hmm stages or whatnot but yeah i my, i still have a handful that have velvet and my biggest deer has velvet as of last night at 8 30 I, I filmed a couple deer last thursday night and they were still in like the velvet looked pretty yeah pretty smooth and, like mm. it wasn't starting to, to tatter or anything that I, you guys answer the question for me why it's lack of at least in those places lack of water down here it doesn't make sense i don't know why yeah that doesn't I, make sense i don't know i i've had since august 15th i've had uh two over two inches of of rain uh, over at this particular farm that i'm talking about so it's not a ton but it's not bad it's not like what mark and those guys in iowa are dealing with i smile because last year you wouldn't have known how much rain you had no i know exactly how much rain i have too because of yeah gas yeah i knew so i had another i had another Game app changer. that would give me alerts when I got rain, but it didn't track it like this. I didn't know totals like I right. know and set a date to when I planted yeah, how much rain. I have exactly. Today. And it's, it is handy, man. It's real nice. Just one more thing to obsess over. Y- yeah. <laughs> exactly right. what we need. <laughs> Last night I got these pictures and so I'm getting ready to take a shower and I'm sitting there taking a, you know, I'm taking a piss. I'm looking at pictures. I'm looking at deer cast maps. And I thought, boy, if my wife walked in on it, she'd be like, what are you doing? Huh. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm multitasking, yeah, baby. I'm constantly looking between the Reconyx cell app and deer cast. I'm just looking basically like a monkey doing a math problem. How am I going to figure this deer out? <laughs> but we'll, we'll get to that uh, disappointment later in the podcast. <laughs> it's just a theme in your life. So, yeah. So I wanted to go back to maps because one thing that I had forgotten that we learned, right? You forget a lot of things until you're back in the situation. It is so much easier to stalk a mule deer when you can see his antler tips. Their eyes are down here, mm-hmm. yeah. their antler tips are up here. So we, we were successful every time we could see their tips mm-hmm. and we weren't when we couldn't. What we ended up using the second to last day is the tracker on deer cast maps. Like he's bedded under this sagebrush or this um, tree and so that we couldn't see his tips and we got close because of deer cast maps. So, and how, explain to me how that helped or what you did to use that feature. Oh, cause like when you're looking at it from 2000 yards away, 
and then you then you get in the area like they all it all looks the same when you're within 100 yards and we go to Deercast maps and go well he betted you pre right you preset here. the waypoint we preset the I guess that's what it is the little triangle and said he's bet under this tree here oh. and when you're 2,000 yards away looking at a Leupold it looks very different than when you actually get there because all the trees look the yeah, same. Yeah, I was envisioning you on your back with no. your phone like this, scooting along. We did, <laughs> we did that a little right bit path. one day. We did. And nice. He's bedded right here. And then what <laughs> ended up happening is by the time we got there, he wasn't bedded where we saw him bed, and we so, just missed it. I don't know what your service was like. Did you guys have to go into offline mode, use offline mm -hmm. maps, so just it's, download it ahead of time? Or? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we did both. Some yeah. days we had Smart. service, other yeah. days we didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because that, that that is the – that is the preferred way of dealing with with low service areas before you go in download your maps mm -hmm. for the area and then when you get there because deercast pulls so much data in turn your phone into airplane mode and then deercast will just pull up your offline maps when you select them and it'll it'll just be a more stable experience and i correct me if i'm wrong but i thought the other day i didn't think it worked like this but the other day i was in offline and the wind checker did work in offline mode, if if it I had, thought we, if, I if thought it, it didn't. A, if it has that weather forecast data cached from hmm. the last time you opened it, that must it be should right. have it. Now, okay. now it, it depends on how long ago it was cached as to how accurate, accurate it's going to be. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny you say that because the second to last day we pushed the wind, which we knew not to do, but mm. we had half an hour to dark. It's so like okay, let's go. Yeah. And we went, and they got within seventy yards. I stayed at hundred filming. They got within hundred. And all of a sudden, they caught the wind cone, like the edge of their wind. Mm -hmm. They were the wind was kind of paralleling them, yeah. and they thought they could get there, but it was a fifteen mile an hour wind, and they caught that cone, and pew, they blew out of there at seventy yards. But it was interesting because we didn't, but I could envision deer cast showing by the time they got there yeah. where the cone would hit, mm -hmm. and that, that is exactly yeah. what happened. It's helpful. Now it doesn't it doesn't tell you like thermals. You know, it can't account for terrain. So right. it I like to move over to like terrain and topo and, yeah. and you know the other options in the map and mm -hmm. just kind of see what what the general the, lay of the land is because that'll affect it yes and i know you guys talk about deer cast and maps and you've been living it and and you invented it as a user who didn't invent it the thing's got all the right bells and whistles like it is an impressive tool impressive yeah well, tool. and it's we're dialing it in every day even better mm -hmm. i mean that here we've been talking about it but here today tim the, this internal group should be testing the final version of sharing waypoints which means hopefully by the end of the week it'll be out to the public so cool. another reason to keep updating your app so mm -hmm. you'll be able to share all your iowa waypoints with me when oh, i go hunt up that's there. fine kind of you. <laughs> go, go for it <laughs> There's some good deer on it. I, so, there's some yeah. really good deer up on my Iowa stuff. <laughs> oh, that means Mark will be at that spot then. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> he's keeping it warm for you. <laughs> he's got a lot of good spots. Yeah, he's wor He's really worried about EHD right now. I mean, they're just not getting any rain. That's they're tough. starting to see all the buzzards flying around. So. And what is so interesting is Alberta had record rainfall this year. So, mm. so normally, which I had forgotten, white tails love switchgrass. Uh, muleys love canola. And normally the canola is halfway up their body. Like the last hunt I filmed was in 2016 and we killed that deer in the standing canola and we used the sprayer tracks to get in on him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This year, if that same scenario happened, the canola's above their back. There's no, you could not see their vitals. Like most of the time, particularly in bottom fields, you just saw their ears. Wow. So it made the hunting them like even more difficult than in the past because of how much yeah, range no they've shot. had up there. Huh. Yeah. Huh. No vitals. Well, well, so, so I guess you didn't get into that, that particular you know, like that didn't happen to you. I mean, you've obviously you killed your deer, but were you waiting for them to go into those tracks again or what? No, because we couldn't. Uh, um, we could we couldn't have used the tracks because when the mule deer stood up, there was no vitals, which yeah, took no out, which took out a significant amount of where they live. The majority. They were like, if I, as I reflect back on it, every year we had a deer called the canola buck. And I guess I never processed it. When you're in your 40s, you think about things a little different than in your 30s and your 20s. It's like, they all live in the canola. Like, why didn't it's anybody like, tell me that that's before? That's G2 Buck. <laughs> he lives somewhere. I those too. Yeah. saw him last night, too. Hey, yeah. Which one? <laughs> oh, the short G2 Buck. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> I name a lot of bucks uh, something the canola about buck. the G2. Sure. <laughs> you yeah. like the G2s, do you? Yeah. Uh, listen. <laughs> As you will find out, it's just one more disappointing characteristic <laughs> for this one guy. I can't it, wait. You know what, though? Like, you can look at it that way, but you also learned a lot of your disappointments, right? Like, a lot of the things Mark and I learned, we actually failed at first. We succeeded a lot, 
But so I look at it as you either win or you learn. We don't should be really fail. freaking good by that. <laughs> <laughs> well, just don't repeat the same mistakes. Like I it's, see. Yeah, and, and that does really that does really separate. Like, is it a failure or is it a lesson? It's a and, lesson. And, and so and, and that's a choice. Like you you have to walk away like and, and be willing to think what did I potentially do wrong there? Every time we failed, like Wade was like, "Why are you analyzing this?" Because like, well, so how do we do it right the next time so that we don't mess this up? You've got to be analytical and figure out. What went wrong? Surprises me about Wade. Well, he's <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> right. He just go shoot the next one. It's like, no, what? Why did we mess this up? Yeah. And how do we do it smarter the next yeah. time? The other thing I loved about being up there at Corey's is you can either have um, adversity or an adventure. And we could have looked at it as like the wind is not in our favor, the canola is too tall, we can't get to the vitals. Woe it takes me. away, yeah, eighty percent. Or it's like, hey, this is going to be interesting to see if we can get one of these suckers bedded not in the canola. Mm-hmm. And things like that. So we had a, at least I had a very great or a very memorable adventure. Yeah. Where there was a fair amount of adversity. Mindset is so important to how you approach the hunt, how you review the hunt, debrief it. Just life in general. Yeah. Yeah. You can be a victim or you can be a student and get better. Yep. Absolutely. put that on a bumper sticker. You can be a victim. (laughs) That sounds like a big sticker. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I got a big bumper. (laughs) It's, that's, that's a whole what sentence on that. <laughs> what it, what's funny is like it's all it's all about you. Like we don't need to. The white tail did right. this. The wind did this. The weather did that. No, it's like you. It's your decisions. You're at the top of the food chain. Figure out what you did wrong and fix it next yeah, time. Yeah, hundred percent. So so last year you were pretty much dialed in. Had Henry on success right off the bat, like mm-hmm. a like a dual dual kill day. How is how are things looking for this year? Well, if you look at Deer Cat, everything's dialed with the exception of the weather. Like, we don't yeah. have a cold front we at all. It. We had it. Right. <laughs> it before the last weekend. Right, before the season <laughs> yeah. was open. And we're not going to have it. I saw it. a ton of deer, too. Oh, well, yeah. The moon was great. The weather was deluxe. And they moved week. like crazy. We, we missed it by a week. And, and it's, it's, you might catch the tail end here on opening day or the first day or two. After that, it's, I mean, the temperatures are so high that it's going to suck. It's not worth it. You'll it, bake in the blind. Yeah. Or well, the tree. And you're going to get to a point where by the time it cools back off, the moon will suck. It, I mean, it's just, unless you're dialed in on something really, really well, mm-hmm. it's not really worth the risk. Yeah. So I not mean, that you're be, asking. He'll be hunting regardless. <laughs> but I can tell you the rest of my recipe for success. It doesn't work for everybody. But so Henry last year, don't a buck. The year before that, don't a buck. Me the year before that, buck. And then two years before that, Justin Buck in September. Like, I fell in love with Missouri September whitetails. The recipe is very simple. you got to have rain, radishes in front of you, in a big enough radish plot that they'll make. The problem with that is by late October, the radishes are gone. Like, yeah. I, don't know what the, yeah. well, I don't know what it is with those daikon radishes or biologic, but they'll walk through almost every other food source in September to get to radishes, and you got to have a north wind in your face. Mm. Like, that's, that's, it's very, in my mind, very simple. Very yeah. first thing you said, though, was rain. Yeah. That's the, the problem, and, and so a lot of guys are dealing with, like, replanting now, and what do I plant this late? Or Not radishes. Oats, yeah, oats, rye, what yeah, do we got? Wheat. And, Wheat or whatever. So yeah. Tur- turnips seem to be good, but like what I found with turnips is like my turnips are this friggin' tall. Well, why is because I planted them right it, and did all the prep work, but they're not eating them and they don't eat turnips until a, probably two frosts or so. Yeah. Which if the weather holds like this, we're gonna get two frosts till mid to late October. No, which has been the <clears throat> thing the last couple of years. Are we're th- that's why clovers becoming more and more key because it really up through you know december almost anymore like mm-hmm. clover is really palatable for them so it's if you can get a good standing clover field you know take keep the weeds out and do all yep. the prep work like that could be deadly yeah so a lot of lot a lot where you go plant say last bite and have some non-typical clover in it and then go back in and frost seed and you'll have a hell of a, a biologic non-typical clover field the next fall yes so. we just hung a stand on saturday and it was like we needed a helmet for a couple of big white oaks that were on this ridge. Yeah. Uh, and and, and I, the deer are really keying in on those right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm excited about this particular stand because there's a, a, a they have that, that soft, or they have the hard mass there that they can come through. And I know Mark and Terry are both talking like they've, because they've, we're pretty one dimensional. Mark's crew, especially in food plot, you know, it's, key, it's the key food. to their success and basically all facets of the season. And if you don't get rain, which they haven't, it exposes a kind of a kink in the metal, so to speak. 
So Big they, time. they, I know uh, strategies are changing water hole sets and getting into the timber, finding the mass crop. And, and it'll be interesting to see if those guys like dad does a, a decent amount of that anyways. Right. Um, but it, it'll be interesting to see what their seasons look like in that regard. Cause they're just having trouble getting their plots to grow uh, other yeah. than the ones they're watering and well, babysitting. Right. Which I, I assume you guys know this. Do you know how much rain one inch of rain on one acre drops. It's, Perry did. He, he 20, did. He did yeah, this. It's twenty seven thousand yeah. gallons. Yeah, so it's a lot. Twenty seven. Because people are like, why don't I just use my uh, four wheeler sprayer that maybe holds fifty to one hundred gallons? Right. It's twenty seven thousand gallons, one inch per. It's a twenty seven and some change, but it's basically twenty seven thousand gallons per acre per inch. Like that's how good Mother it's Nature is. Not gonna is. fit on your four wheeler. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's no, a no. lot of watering, and that's why you know it's <clears throat> when Scott and I talk about it, it's like. All right, well, we're not watering. <laughs> like that's not a because you got to do it a lot, a lot, and you got to babysit. You can't just do it. Yeah, I got it on Monday. I'll come back on Sunday. Like that ain't gonna cut it. Once you start watering them, you got to kind of. Right. It's like you got to feed that beast. So it's just like, well, <laughs> we better pray for rain, dude, because <laughs> we're not gonna go to that length. You know, not many that's, people can. Not many people can. It's pretty extreme, and I know Mark does it and Terry does it, but still, even then, I think their water tanks are seventeen hundred gallons. So that's ten. Car trailer loads full for one eight one acre. They're, they're literally siphoning their ponds out of water. Right. Right. <laughs> like, Correct. Dad, one year, I think he killed off his. You know, he had a, a pond that had great crappie fishing. <laughs> no more fishing. Oh, that, not out of that pond. No. I mean, they had they. This is a few years back, but got it down that. so low. It makes me sad. Yeah. Yes. I mean, but you know what? What's we're not known for fishing. Right. You know, as much as well, we love to moves like that. <laughs> You know, Terry could have been the crappy master. And for what it's worth, I think he uses Zepco, you assholes. <laughs> I got a lot of like crap father for like using son. A Zepco. Why? Because I the guess the push I'm, button. Yeah, because it's a push button. <laughs> Don't show up on social media with a Zepco. <laughs> Let me tell you, <laughs> got that's, killed. <laughs> yeah, that's that's totally fine. I think. Yeah, me too. Because yeah. I never fish. <laughs> yeah, this is easy. <laughs> this is a beginner's setup. <laughs> okay, Tim, you elitist. That's right. <laughs> Hey, so we got some really interesting footage from uh, Cody and Brian. Oh, sure. Cody and Brian. Where? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cody and Sherrick, Brian Weiss. Mm -hmm. Where were they? They, uh, somewhere out Nebraska, somewhere <laughs> out in that neck of the woods. But they sent it in to us. We threw it up in DeerCast, but it's this, re it's this week's real wild clip. Huh. It's a crazy clip of a deer with three hooves. Ooh. Deer are supposed to have four hooves. Are they? Based on my my training in biology, <laughs> but y'all don't that's, say that. That's, a, that's a word on the street is. Gotcha. So let's take a look at this uh, this real wild clip and see what's up here. All right, all right. Sure enough, he's that back leg there. One, two, three. Huh. I mean, he kind of looks like he's got something. A nub. He's got a nub. He's stumpy. <laughs> it, you know, it's weird because he's. He's trying to use it like well, it's like it's full length, that's but just it's muscle memory, brain yeah. telling the, the the legs still there. But so. it, we call that deer tripod. It, it, it makes you wonder if this is a recent injury because you would think that a deer that he would have adjusted already. Yeah, mm -hmm. compensation, but he's acting like yeah. It's, you'd have thought by now he had a peg leg or something. He just fastened onto that thing. <laughs> and, a prosthetic. Yeah. He, anyway, the a little eye. wheelie cart. I'm in awe with their ability to survive. Like I couldn't walk on one leg, mm -hmm. and he's he, he looks. He doesn't look get, bad. He's, he's getting along pretty yes, good. Yes, exactly. You know, but the reality is, he's probably the first to get killed by a coyote. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's just kind of barely walking through that that uh, field there. But, but see how acute his senses are. <laughs> like he's like, if if that deer has all four legs, my guess is he's not that aware. You know what I mean? Like his sure. senses are heightened because he understands he's it's a daredevil. Much Go easier prey than head he on was. The swivel. <laughs> right. Much easier prey than he was when he had all four legs. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You wonder what happened, you know, what the he's getting caught in a fence or you never know, something like that. But yeah. Yeah, pretty Weird. cool. Interesting. Huh. Jared, that's the real wild clip of the week. It's I like wild. it. <laughs> all right. Tim, Kay. what's next? Question of the day. All right. Question of the day is probably brought to you by DeerCast Rain Stations. Prep your locations to perfection with historical, current, and forecasted precipitation amounts. 
Hey, this is Spencer Fisher, and my question for you guys is, how do you determine a deer's age on the spot when you only have seconds to make that decision to shoot or not shoot? Thanks a lot. Good question, Spencer. Jared, what do you got? I adopted this rule of thumb 20 years ago, and if we put too much emphasis on age and score, the score should be, are you pumped to pull the trigger? That's how you yeah, know the deer's point. big enough. Yeah. And in Iowa, what I always tell Justin is, if the deer doesn't scare you, it's not a shooter. Like, if you have to debate whether it's a shooter or not, yeah. it's not. It's not. It's not. 10.5 times out of 10, if you have to decide in your head if it's a shooter or not, it's not. 100%. You won't be happy with that deer when you, if you're looking for three years old and older. But if you don't have to debate and go, bam, it looks like a shooter, then mm -hmm. that's how you age it in the moment of truth. Okay. So, say you're not in Iowa. Yeah, yeah. And Missouri, too. I mean, in general, I would think there's a couple quick ways, though, that you yes. look at your spot and you're looking for. One easy way is if they're around any other deer, that, that usually they look, bigger. they look bigger. It's not like a little bit like it's usually a no brainer because it, you could if it's a young if a young buck is around, say, uh, an older doe, doe uh -huh. like they're going to be about the same body size. You know, they're, they're you're going to be able to tell. Mm -hmm. But when a mature buck steps out, it's very obvious. And then the other thing about it is the the general um, feel that the, the general vibe that the field takes on the other deer. Like when a mature buck steps out, they look at them, they look at them and they usually cower a little bit. They get the hell out of the way. T you know, most of the time, parting you can of the tell. seas. Yeah, so that's that's one like easy way if you don't really know how to look at the belly or the the you know size of the head or any of those mm -hmm. types of things. That's an easy way to to, to think about it. And like I always say, the best answer to every question is it depends. Are we talking September? Or are we talking late October? Because yeah. yeah, when they're big late October, you're talking Barry Bonds the year he hit 73 home runs, or Brian yeah. Urlacher in his peak as a linebacker for Chicago Bears. Like that's Bulk a five-year-old and older whitetail, right? Their necks, their heads, yeah. everything is bigger because that testosterone level is at an annual high mm -hmm. at, the, at the end of October. Yeah. Yeah, we had a deer last year that was kind of a fooler. Like we weren't <laughs> sure if he was four and a half or five and a half. And in the summer, all summer, which I always struggle with aging in the summer, they got that summer coat on. They all kind of look a little bit skinnier. And it's like, uh, I, I think he's young, you know, especially standing next to other bucks. I'm thinking he's young. We get into the season and he kind of bulks up. It's like, oh, shit, maybe he's older than we're thinking. And now this year he he – he was out actually the night I killed my deer in uh, January and this year he's back and it's obvious. It's a no brainer, no doubter to your point. Mm -hmm. It's like rack is just okay. But if you look at the, the body, body it's mm -hmm. a no doubter. He's a mature buck. He's five and a half at least. And you could just tell the muscle structure, the tone in general, he's got a different frame, a body frame yeah. to him. Yes. Yeah. And, and some of those, some of those things that you look at are like the brisket. Is there, yes. you know, is there mm -hmm. some, the meat, the, is there some meat there? And then, their back does it does it have a little sway to it and then their belly they got a gut on them yeah. those are the kind of like when they get really old they got kind of that roman nose on them yeah. like th there are some things but then the other like the other aspect of this is if you run trail cameras 100 percent. You, you, you you will probably know who the deer are as you see them and so hopefully you're not having to make that split second decision because I, I know my faculties. I'm not my sharpest when I got a, a buck in front of me. So I hope to not have to make that judgment call in the moment. Where that gets tough is like during the rut when they're moving, you know, and, you, it's a wild card. and you're in the timber. So mm -hmm. the way we hunt, obviously, like we hunt a lot of field edges, food plots. So we get a lot more time to study and age and watch them walk out. It's not like this rush, rush, rush thing. But once the rut hits and we're in the timber and boy, <laughs> it's it's. Here it, comes. it is intense, and that's when mistakes usually happen. So that's when you really have to be on your game because you only got a second to figure it out. Mm -hmm. That's what I was answering that question right there. Yeah. He's got to scare you. Like yeah. a mature – I don't know why, and maybe because I've been doing this so long, like a mature deer should just go send the red flag signal, that is a mature deer, and an immature one shouldn't shouldn't do that whether you're a brand-new hunter or not. If you're, if you're on the edge, like is he yes. or isn't he? Don't. He Don't. isn't. That's, he isn't. that's typically the answer is uh, no. Unless right. it's the very end of the season. <laughs> and then he is. And, and, you, <laughs> and you have not filled a tag See, and you really want to fill a tag, then you know maybe the calculus changes yeah, a little bit. Sure. And Yes. And I look at that slightly different. It's like you want to fill a tag, just shoot a doe mm -hmm. or two or three yeah. or four. Like we put a lot of emphasis on the rack. And the, the big deal with those whitetails are if you don't take them out of the herd, Everybody goes, well, the next guy's going to. Not all, not, not necessarily. Yeah, depends on where you're hunting. Well, <laughs> true. It does. 
For sure. Tim, when you're hunting 10 acres or whatever, <laughs> five, two, the other, the other guy's going to get you. I was just talking to a buddy who was talking to another buddy of ours, and he's got video of this really great buck that went running through the property. It was a nine acre piece that, that he hunts. And this other guy was like, oh yeah, I hunt 500 yards away from you in suburbia. I know that deer. <laughs> we passed him last year too. That is hey, that, that was is, that, to, for all of them to pass it last year. Like that's awesome. I mean, mm-hmm. at least you yeah. kind of got a general consensus. Very there. rare, yeah, for sure, <laughs> yeah, for sure. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a great question. So if folks want us to answer a question on the air, just click the link in the show notes and uh, submit it via our SpeakPipe account. Make it quick, and uh, if you do, we read it on the air. We'll send you a podcast hat. So Spencer, reach out to, uh, to to us on the Rack Pack uh, if you're in there, and uh, our two, you know, Drury Outdoors, and we will get you taken care of. Heck yeah! Okay, good question. Was very pertinent. All, All right. right. All right. Wildlife word. It's brought to you by Deercast Wind Check. Scout and access your trail cams with confidence using Deercast Wind Check. Okay. Science question. Woo-wee. This is right up my alley. You're a scientist. Cure cancer. Cure cancer for living. Doctors. Okay. Among other functions, what does vitamin K do for deer? Does it A, thin their blood, B, help their blood coagulate, C, retain heat in their blood, or D, vitamin K is a myth and everyone knows it, including you guys? Well, doctor. What's uh, <laughs> doctor coagulate? Like? Vitamin K is a coagulant. Jared's more, going with I'm, I'm going to go with B. Yeah, <laughs> definitely good B. Call, good call. <laughs> go with the doctor. Yeah. 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 This yeah. is it, like, this reminds me of school. I'm looking over. I'm peeking at his answer. The answer's Cooper- B. Cooperative work. <laughs> Just yeah. slide it over this way, Jared. It, it's one of the things that makes him so amazing, like so darn tough to kill is like you can hit him and th- their ability to coagulate blood is just incredible. Correct. It, we noticed it again a long time ago and to, to, to people that haven't, field dress that many deer, field dress an archery shot deer and look at how, how much coagulation is in there. Like it's incredible. They still coagulate Mm -hmm. after they pass. Yeah. And, and it's again, their ability to survive. And then the other thing I think about whitetails, if you think about them compared to every other big game creature, they cover the largest geographic territory in North America and therefore the most diverse climate, right? They're in Northern Alberta and they go all the way down south into Mexico, same species, and they can survive all of those conditions. Now, the Alberta whitetails can't survive in Mexico and vice versa, but nonetheless, yeah, that creature is very adaptable, and yeah. one of their key strengths is when they start to leak blood, they immediately can stop it. That's why it's so important to, you know, when you shoot one and you're questioning the hit, like, don't Just go wait. push it. Just wait. Uh-huh. Because, I mean, we could take shit all day about this, and we always have, but if you push it, there's a good chance not they're going to coagulate and keep going <laughs> and you're not going to find it. And they may have died. There's a good chance they did die, but you got no blood to go off of. Yeah. Yes. Well, how many times have you been field dressing a deer and like the, what's in their rib cage has all coagulated. Yes. Like it's, a, it's, a it's, a, it's like a jello mass in yes. there. Yeah. It's incredible. So, so the other point I want to make about this, cause I think a lot of archers are confused and, and I am a major proponent of expandable, uh, broadheads, not mm-hmm. fixed blade. What, what are you trying to do when you kill a whitetail with a bow and arrow? You're causing death by hemorrhage. So if you're trying to cause hemorrhage, why would you shoot an inch and a quarter broadhead versus a two and a half? Because it could go through the shoulder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it has you know more what? fuck. <laughs> F-O-C or How about this? How about this? How about this? Don't hit the shoulder. You haven't heard about this? No, front of center. Yeah, I, I have. just never heard anyone pronounce it. That way. Well, how would you pronounce it? <laughs> I would say F-O-C. Ah, you got to say it like fuck. <laughs> That's what it spells, Tim. I... It, yep. Anyway, I don't want to knock on the other broadheads. I mean, I'm sure there's a time and a place. I just don't know in my travels of North America what that time and place are. Expandable broadheads. We shot them at Moose in Manitoba. Reisner and I did a few years ago. We shot them at Caribou, basically at the North Pole and Northwest Territories. Rage broadheads. Just expandable Two plus inches, because you're mm-hmm. going for hemorrhage. Why not get the most hemorrhage you can? Which rage do you shoot? Chisel tip 2.3 okay. at literally everything. Mule deer, white tail. Are you shooting elk. the old collared version or the, the yeah, new? Yeah, the collared ones. Yeah. Still the collared. I haven't experimented with the no collar just yeah. yet. So it's it's funny because like the meme pages just kill us for bad shots and um, you know using expandable broadheads. And I don't understand it. Like We've killed 
thousands of deer, thousands of deer between the team over the last 15 years of using expandable broadheads. And most of the time with pretty good shots. I mean, it's all about shot placement, obviously. But, I mean, man, it's like they feel like you're – using expandable has kind of come out of favor for some weird reason. Like it used to be all the rage (laughs) pun intended. (laughs) And then now it's like, yeah, man, Oh no, I would never do that. I'm going to shoot these fixed blade. I got to go through the, the shoulder blade. It's like, why the hell would you aim for that? Exactly. There's aim back two inches and you're, it's not that hard. If you look at the anatomy of the, especially in deer cast track, you see it like that shoulder, blade the way it's not like your typical mm-hmm. shoulder blade it's not blocking the vitals it's going a little triangle it's basically telling you where to shoot if you just back off of it a few inches yeah and tight like biologically it's not even a shoulder because no. it's yeah. like it's this uh, yeah yeah and, and it just kind of it's it's held in place by muscles yes. so there's not a big thick you know ball and socket joint in, in there like there is on a human i don't know I think it unfairly gets a lot of uh, expandables in general, not just rage, but they unfairly get a lot of heat lately for not really good reason. Yeah, right. I just I, it's unfortunate that that's the argument we're having. When in rea- I mean, common sense ain't all that common anymore, which is what John Mabry always says. And it's like again, you're going for hemorrhage. Why not cut the biggest hole well, you can? Doctor Strickland, uh, yep. he was not Bronson Strickland. This is uh, what was his first name? I'm trying to, he was a Warren, heart Warren. Warren. Yeah, he was a heart surgeon, right? Cardiothoracic surgeon. And he Transplanted came heart out with one of the original, the Strick Nine. Yeah, the Strick Nine broadhead. Cool name. And it was that that was before Rage and before Larry Polkerback created Rage. So this would have been in the early 2000s, I yeah, guess. Yeah, tw- 20 plus years ago. And he always said that as a heart surgeon that you uh, a big hole you know that's they can't survive it right yeah. so you want to try to create the biggest it's, hole right. possible and the that biggest cut you can yeah can do that i think the old argument used to be like the system or the setup of how it would deploy and oh it deployed on me in flight and a lot of that's user error you know not checking it back especially in the collar days but now with the no collar they've kind of prevented that altogether mm-hmm. so yeah, I, I think people kind of pick a lane and they just like that becomes their team. People do it with politics. They do it with a lot of things in life. You just pick a team. And whether you're right or wrong, you defend well, it. Well, it's fine. funny because that argument has been going on for 20 years <laughs> about fix versus expandable. And it's really technology has gotten better. Like who, the materials have gotten better. Who cares? It's obvious they work <laughs> like mm-hmm. it's there's enough people have used them. It's obvious. It's not a gimmick. Right. So I don't know. It's a weird that's a weird one for me. A weird argument. Same. But so. that's not the only thing that people have beef with us about. <laughs> they have a lot of beef with us, and most of it is about me. <laughs> Just wait. We, yeah, got, we, got, we got a good one for you down here. It's which you are surrounded with uh, negativity, and what I always say at work is, why are we catering to the vocal minority? Mm-hmm. Right. That I think the the beef you're getting is the vocal minority, the 95 percent of people that aren't saying anything, that are watching and are learning. No doubt. Those are the people that like we really are impressed by as fans, whereas the folks that are just negative Nancys and keyboard warriors, I, <laughs> I have a unique ability to go. Same, because we've gotten it for so long. Usually we don't uh, go down this still lane. still bothers you, though. Yes. <laughs> so, Tim, take it away. So we're going to spend the next 45 minutes dissecting uh, some feedback. Okay, so we, we always get, I got to okay. get to work. <laughs> so, so here's the deal. We always do a shout-out, all right? And it's always positive. And we always say, hey, we welcome the negative, too. But it's, positive it's, because they're, it's, they, they are positive. It's 99.9% we get positive sure. feedback and shout-out. So we, we, we like to say, hey, thanks for leaving this comment. Yeah. We didn't get a positive one this week, so we're going to read that too because we always say, bag. "Yeah, well, <laughs> we get blessed." All right, Tim, go ahead, just take it. Okay. So, Aaron's twenty-two on Apple Podcasts says, "Disappointed." Yeah. Okay. So we're going to also. <laughs> That's fine. Dissect That's how fine. he spells. Okay. <laughs> um, I think it's supposed to be disappointed. Okay. I'd love to write a great review. I really would, but I've been following the jury since Madness 1. I would hate to guess how many hours upon days worth of videos I've watched learning from Mark and Terry. I owe much of the success I have from what I've learned from them. Same. That being said, I'm left completely puzzled how Matt Drury <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> can essentially be in the presence of two of the best and most efficient deer hunters in this country has or ever will ever see and be clueless on some of the topics or talking points brought up by the guests. <laughs> 
The Drury name carries a ton of clout in the deer hunting community. I find it sad to say that unless Mark or Terry have the floor on the podcast, I find it hard to listen. I'm 42. <laughs> and if I want to laugh, I'll listen to a comedian. If I want great deer hunting advice, I'd love to come here and find it. He spelled here H-E-A-R. I'm just oh, pointing right. that out. <laughs> Not that the Drury's oh, owe me anything. <laughs> Not a dime's worth of knowledge. They have learned the hard way, and for that, I'm grateful to them. But I see a golden opportunity being missed here. E-A-R. God bless. <laughs> what, what were you... Uh, anytime you're around Mark or Terry, no matter who you are, you're going to sound a little bit clueless. On deer. Uh, yes, correct. <laughs> yes, like there are, there are nobody in this world, maybe the exception of one or two people, that have had the amount of time, energy, and effort that those two have spent in the woods learning and per perfecting their craft. So I don't, I don't get this. Uh, it's okay. I get shit. <laughs> I mean, it is what it is. It's, you know, we read all the good ones. We read the bad one, but it's, uh, it's not for lack of, we've, we've covered this before. And I think actually on, we give Kurt and working class bunch of shit, but we were on his podcast and he asked like, what's the yeah. kind of around this question? Thing. Like, yeah, like as a tough, you know, do you worry about the way people think about you or like how it relates to Mark and Terry? Is there a lot of pressure? Listen, that I'm not Mark and Terry. I'm not going to be. And I try to learn. I've learned a ton from them. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's not like I'm a schlub in the deer woods. Killed three good bucks last year. Not on any of their properties. I mean, this is <laughs> on my own. So it is what it is. I try. <laughs> and that's the thing. You don't have 30 years of knowledge. Like, when did you really start deer hunting for yourself? About Four years ago? Seven. Seven six, years ago? You know. So you're still... I'm a I novice say it all the time. You're still a novice still compared learning. to them of 35 plus years of white tail. Here's the other way I look at it that Mark and Terry started. Mark has been at it a long time, but Terry, you know, Terry, like getting serious, serious about white tail hunting. They started the company. I think Mark was like 23. Terry was 33. Mm -hmm. I'm at 40, at 40, like I'm probably about on pace <laughs> like, with what they knew at the exactly. time. Exactly. I'm not just totally an idiot. Right. So well, and the other thing is if, if we call this the Mark and Terry Drury podcast mm -hmm. and then people tune in and it's they're not us, there. It's like then be pissed off. <laughs> like then it's well, that's a bait and switch. The description says <laughs> we don't know everything and we have expert guests on who do. Which is the beauty of a podcast. Yeah. yeah. So. Have them on as a podcast and yeah. ask and learn yourself. Like, I think this is a great platform. Like, yeah, you, uh, uh, I know folks that listen to this podcast that are I younger know. and they're learning. Like, they're younger and they're yeah. learning. Somebody's listening to it. Yeah. Somebody. Uh, <laughs> I don't know didn't who. you say multi-million number of views? A couple million like, views yes. and listens. Somebody's learning. Yeah, so. so I've got a palate cleanser for you, Matt. Thank oh. you. Here you go. Palate that. cleanser. What's this? This says, okay. This is... A different shout out. Thank you guys. I really appreciate what you do in helping educate the hunting world and keeping it 100% real. Mm -hmm. I love how you guys are down to earth and for the most part share similar experiences as your, as your everyday hunter, hoping soon to be moving into a new house on some property and will definitely use some of the pointers you both have shared to help turn my property into a nice usable hunting piece. Take care and thanks again. Jake, a.k.a. Maine Born Redneck. Well, that's very nice of Jake. So he's from Maine? Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's the cool thing. You're reaching people because of this podcast in Maine. Outside we've of the Midwest. Yeah. People up in Canada. and I mean, we've gotten notes from... We touch a lot of people. <laughs> Which is great. Wanted or unwanted. It depends. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I knew we flew past this, but there's something I learned about Canada that I didn't realize before. Seventy-five. So people may not know this. Canada's probably 40% bigger than the U.S. from a landmass perspective. Maybe bigger. 380 million Americans, 38 million Canadians. So it's sparse. Yeah. And 70% and of those Canadians live within an hour and a half of the U.S. border. 90% wear flannel. Well, that could be true. <laughs> that could be true. And, you know, because like Wade was like, did anybody know us up here? Everybody knows us up there. Like everybody. Oh. Even before all of this and the internet and Facebook and all that stuff, people recognized Mark Dury when all we had were videos, videos. back in the day. And Wild TV was Th a those, big Those, big those folks are born. And then as soon as they can walk, yeah, those folks are born. As soon as they can walk, they send them outside. I thought that's, I heard that. Yeah, you did. That's what they do in Canada. Like, they are outdoorsy. Yeah. More so are. than any those of us. Good flannel, people. Those flannel wear. <laughs> Not even flannels. <laughs> They're good people, uh, man. They're always very kind. They're very nice. It's, it's a 
I love going up there. It's been a little bit, but I'd like to go back. Take someday. off, eh? Yeah. And, and then the other thing about them that's relatable, Mark and Terry, that I don't think people see is like the Jarvises, they're masters at their craft. It was like watching, as painful as this is, analogy is, a master chess player just huh. move the pieces and literally carve up the competition. Yeah, that's what, fun that's to what, see someone do that's that. That's what Tyler and Corey do. And while I was filming, Tyler helped Wade do it. Like, mm -hmm. Wade is a phenomenal white hunter. I mean, this guy's yeah. good. But we still needed Corey and Tyler to get us in bow range. And they go, whoosh, whoosh. and it was just yeah. watching a master tactician at his craft, whether it be a cabinet maker or a concrete mm -hmm. finisher, somebody that's really good at their job and you Im impressed by it. That was what I enjoyed about watching Tyler and Corey do their job. And, and that takes a certain amount of humility as as a hunter to be like, okay, huh. this is not my this is not my environment. I need to let this expert do their thing and not try to guide them. Stay in your guy. lane. Yeah. Right? Here is the I the fundamental problem with a lot of hunters. Like I have no problem watching baseball and going, Albert Pujols is way better at hitting a ball than me. Jim Tomey's way better at hitting a ball than me. Adam Wainwright is way better at throwing a ball than me. But for whatever reason, whitetail hunters watch TV and go, he's got a better spot. <laughs> and I don't I know why do that better. <laughs> right. And I could do it better. And that's not true. Like, why does he, ha why does Mark have a better spot? Why did Terry? Cause they created it 20 plus years ago and they recognized in order to do what we want to do and kill the biggest white tails on the planet and do it better than anybody else. We've got to have our own spots and they created all of those yeah. things. So for whatever reason, people can't admit that you are a better hunter than them. And I don't know why that, why that exists inside of us but it eh, does it's just guys the same reason we don't stop and ask for directions yeah, yeah but, but that proud. same guy would i would think would go albert pujols can hit a baseball oh, there's farther plenty than of armchair quarterbacks though you well, know what i mean true. think that's about true. it there's plenty of I, Monday i've morning been reading a lot of mm -hmm. of you know a lot of the feeds around albert because it's just it's been so fun to watch <laughs> this History. resurgence and history yeah. and so i'm just sucked in i'm fully it's like we're in the playoffs before the playoffs start and so i'm reading up a lot and you go to the comments and there's always <laughs> people there for as many people that are happy for him from other teams there's <sighs> always people that say yeah oh, he's on steroids he's on steroids <laughs> these are the same people that were clapping for mcguire in 98 well in 98 it was a much different we didn't know the public didn't know right. it's a lot harder you know you look at fernando tatis jr and he got he got yeah, eighty something game suspension or whatever it is. Like you don't get away with it like you did back then. Right, right. A and it would be foolish for this guy to just start doing it for the last forty games of the season for ego. The guy doesn't have an ego like that. He doesn't right. like he. The first eleven years for the Cardinals, he was genuinely that great. He was unbelievable. Every time, we, just your brother and I, we'd go down the ballpark almost every Friday night when they were in town, you know, straight out of college and nothing else to do, money to burn, right? Let's go get some beers, watch baseball, watch and have work fun. Is magic. He, we'd be down at so many games. This was 04, so many games in the ninth inning. We'd be down, and we'd be like, ah, we're going to win this. And sure shit, like that team, him, it was unbelievable. And he's that kind of magic. It's back. He's yes. it's something about this town and his love affair with the Cardinals that he's back to his old ways. It's fun to watch. He is a lot of fun to watch. The Cardinals are a lot of fun to watch right now. Absolutely. And and your point is well taken about there's negative Nancy's all over yeah. Albert Pujols right now. Yeah. And you know what he's doing? Just hitting bombs. He, did, yeah. he, he just keeps doing it. He, yeah, which is what we should do too. There's yeah. negative Nancy's everywhere. Tim, why'd you let this shout out in here? <laughs> <laughs> trying to get in get into my head man <laughs> we talked about devoting a whole show to it <laughs> i was gonna hashtag clueless i was gonna put it up on this tv back here and start circling all the grammar issues this guy had We're gonna it's go fine. <laughs> we need to get this guy's ip address i was gonna get petty but <laughs> we got somewhat petty. Like, who knows don't search it it could be me we you, didn't you never know <laughs> oh, hiding in keyboard Jordan, warrior I, anonymity i, I, I don't this think wrong. you would spell here h-e-r you just twice. never know <laughs> just never know uh well we we do have some folks who are are, uh, happy about what we're doing here on the show, and they just jumped in the 100% Wild Rack Pack. The Rack Facebook. Pack is growing, dude. How yeah, many man. are we up to now? I, I think we're pushing 1.2 thousand. Look at <laughs> us. Hey, we only started hey. it. I don't like the way you said that. 1.2 K. <laughs> I thought you were going to say million. Well, we just started it. <laughs> I like Pretty it. good for a couple of schlubs that <laughs> right. this guy's disappointed in. He must not be a Rack Packer. <laughs> so, basically, private Facebook group. You just type in Dre Outdoors, 100% Wild, Rack Pack, mm -hmm. go right to it. And um, there's some shenanigans in there. And, and honestly, the cool part, especially now that we're getting into the season, guys are putting pictures in of, like, stuff that they're killing or deer yeah. they're chasing or whatever. It's it's fun and, you know, get people congratulating 
and it's a community that some of our real wild clips have come from our yeah. backers, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, Tim always uh, lists a bunch of names out. I read them off. I always butcher the names and then there's a fake one somewhere in there. So. And usually someone hops on in the rack pack and says, I'm a real person. <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause usually I'm talking about their name. Like there's no way this guy's real. And then they get into the rack pack. They're like, yeah, I'm yeah, real. I'm real. <laughs> Good Sorry. news is they're listening all the way through the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Cause this is always That's a thing. <laughs> Dude, we got like a 90-something percent listen rate. Like, it's a crazy high percentage. They listen all the way through, and they're usually like an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. So, good stats. It's entertainment. Unreal. It's education, right? It's a the time word suck. I, uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> infotainment. Yeah, if people are driving, people, you know, I mean, there's, it's just a time suck for a lot of people. I think about, like, my drive's an hour each way. I, I need a time suck, <laughs> you know? I listen to Andy, Fursella, and Sal every now and again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're 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 out there. I hope to one day I'm gonna have Sal on here. I'm not I'm not brave enough to ask Andy, <laughs> but one day I'll have Sal on. He's got so much uh, uh, knowledge when it as it pertains to leadership. That's it's it's amazing. He's hunting this year, by the way. Where he's got a farm that um, is not far from my lease, and um, I looked at it last year. It was too late for me to put any food plots. I didn't end up hunting over there, but it's in a great area. And so Kyle McClellan mm -hmm. is actually put in food plots and put a blind Good. up and I saw he posted he's got a new Matthews so Yeah, yeah. Yep. So Matt Legler was our guy that had to assert his his actual oh, his name. existence. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. That was something that was something I forgot to mention earlier. I said it right after I killed my mule deer, which is you got to have the right guide in in when you're outfitting, but like the guide also should be you on your whitetail properties and learn from your mistakes and you got to have the right gear. I am uber impressed with that Matthews. Like oh, they're uber. smooth. And not just smooth. Like when it hits the target, like it, bam, yeah. like it, there's a lot of force coming with that. Yeah. Thing. They're fun to shoot. They're yeah. fun to, and to keep every year coming out with something, which they, all the boat companies do come out with something new or it's a little bit it's, better. It's yeah. crazy how to keep up mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. I don't know how to do it. So, all right. So the names this week, we got Aaron Graff, Phil, Tony, two first names, Ooh. Uh, Caleb Garner, Adam Ross, Michael Cheek, Brandon Orr, <laughs> Michael Barnes, Camlene, Camlene. That's the fake name this week. Lucas Hicks. I picked it hey. out like that. Scott thought you would. Camlene. <laughs> Is it because I have Camlene? Is it something that Dude, I'm doing wrong? Know, Do I need to look at my, <laughs> my some bows have some bows have it. Yeah. A little extra twist in your yoke and you need to get sometimes that fixed. it's just the shooter. <laughs> Literally your arms <laughs> leaning. <laughs> you got walleye vision there, buddy. <laughs> Not hitting the target quite right. Well, oh boy. Jared, so first hunt, you're gonna be out there opening day or no? Oh, absolutely not. Yeah. No, that's that, uh, that's that's no. the thing I think Deercast taught a lot of younger guys. You don't need to go opening day. You need to go when the conditions are right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Unless you're just dialed in. Yeah, that, that's fine. I mean, yeah. Yes, I'm not. Not that I'm not dialed in. My spots are set up for a northwest wind yeah. with the wind in our face. And until yeah. we get that, I'm not going. Yeah. All right, now, do you have some good deer on camera? Mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good deer. Yeah. Uh, to the point that Nora, who's a third grader, Henry shot his first deer in third grade, so she wants to go this year. Nice. So we'll try oh. Henry and Nora. Awesome. And then one of my goals recently, which I didn't accomplish last year, is introduce also a new archer to the sport. Two years ago, my nephew Vincent. This year, who knows, but maybe one of Henry's friends at MICDS, Matt, <laughs> right? Matt. He's not a new archer. <laughs> Shitty but archer, but uh, <laughs> disappointing take archer. Take a little, little cousin Matt along this time. I'm going to change my am, Instagram handle to I the took, disappointed <laughs> archer. <laughs> he could, he's got an Iowa tag, right? I I've do. got... He's, Several hundred acres sitting yeah. there that I'm not hunting bow season this year because I don't live there anymore. Um, so I'd love to go check one. it out for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you would do that for no, him? If really, I'm just going wherever Mark tells me to sit. Smart. I'm gonna, yeah. gonna go sit. Don't bad the guy. No, and I can't wait for the comments to say you didn't earn that book. <laughs> I'm gonna be like, you Must know what? Nice. Yes, I've worked did. here 20 years. Believe me, I've earned it. <laughs> so, <laughs> not just that. <laughs> no, not just that. No. He's it's behind. It's surprising. This is the first time. <laughs> 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 no, it, should, it should be fun though i'm looking forward to it i'm going to try to since he is worried about ehd they're putting like full court press on his property to try to harvest some deer early on yeah. before they die he think he's pretty confident that they're going to start dying on him through october and, yeah. and november not, so it, it i know he's 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 um He's glass he's in a half difficult empty on right this now. topic, right. but he's been through it several times. So mm -hmm. he's not optimistic. He's not pessimistic. He's realistic. Mm -hmm. Like I would say about the, does the is it half full or half empty? No, the glass has water in it. And Mark is very realistic. He is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and 
maybe he's wrong. Maybe they won't stop dying. But usually when it comes to whitetails, he's not off by much. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to go up. I'm going to try to hit that first full moon and be October. up there. Yeah, in October. And hopefully a cool friend hits and we'll see what happens. Iowa so. whitetails are fun. Not that any other whitetails aren't. They're just, it's just, I don't know. It's fun. I've only been up there. I filmed once or twice, but obviously I've never had a tag, never hunted. So I'm anxious to see what it's like for myself and, and uh, get it, you know. It, they're 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 just a little different than Missouri whitetails. They're actually less predator aware for some reason. Mm. I don't know why. Yeah. Like Missouri whitetails, I don't really like them that much. Like they're better staying alive. Yes. Yes. Well, they're getting shot at. <laughs> I guess. A I, lot. I, th- I guess. I don't know what it is. So. I'm not saying they're easier. Yeah. They just will allow more than a Missouri whitetail yeah. will. Yeah. Well, hopefully right. I see one. Well, season's <laughs> starting. Uh, everyone is so excited. Like it's go time. Yep. It's go time. And that Labor Day happened, right? Like the cool front hit, and everybody's like, you felt it in your bones. Oh, yeah. You felt it in your mm-hmm. genetic makeup. Like, Sleeping with the windows open. Yeah. White tail season. Yep. Yeah. It, it's here. Summer's over. I'm back in the fall. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Good, good luck, luck everybody. everybody. Make sure that you're staying safe and being smart out there. All right. Thanks for joining us, Jared. Yeah. Thanks for good having luck me. this season. Yeah. You too. Until next time. Thanks, Peace Tim. out, everybody. DeerCast is now supercharged with maps. Get ahead of your game with killer new features like live Doppler radar, wind check out to five days, virtual rain gauges, GPS path tracking, and more. Plus, get our 14-day revolutionary DeerCast prediction and access to DeerCast track. Prep, predict, and pursue with DeerCast. We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This episode of DOD TV was brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's.